Hello and welcome. This is the Into the Wilderness podcast and our Science Shorts series with me, your host, Byron Pace. These shows are going to guide you through the fascinating, if complex, world of conservation and environmental stewardship. From grappling with controversial topics like trophy hunting to the global impacts of invasive earthworms in the Arctic, if it has anything at all to do with our understanding of science in the natural world, we are going to dig into it. I hope that you will continue to join me every two weeks as I speak with scientists, environmental advocates, conservationists, wildlife managers, and a diverse array of global guests to uncover the complex nature of the world we live in. We aim to make the science of conservation more accessible, exploring stories and research from the front line. And I really believe that the only way that we can help improve our decision making is through understanding. And in that way, we can define the Anthropocene for the betterment of humanity and the planet. And so to this week's show, and we are sticking with the theme of climate change from two weeks ago, but turning our attention to a potential solution to removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And it just so happens that this solution may also help rebuild the health of our soils, which are rapidly depleting around the world. I spoke with Professor David Beerling from the Department of Animal and Plant Science from the University of Sheffield, who incidentally also has a new book out called Making Eden, How Plants Transformed a Barren Planet, which is printed by Oxford University Press and is currently available on Amazon. And the link uh, for that book, if you enjoy this podcast, definitely go and check out the book. Uh, That's in the show notes. But before we jump in, if you like these shows, you can also read my monthly column on the Modern Huntsman website entitled, appropriately, Into the Anthropocene, which actually went live only a few days ago as this podcast goes out. Well, the the second installment went live. I actually had a column out a month ago as well. Uh, But this month, I am writing about the problem with protected areas and what we now know about the mass mortality of elephants seen in Botswana a few months ago. The link to this is in the show notes, but if you Google Modern Huntsman, it won't take you long to find it. Uh, One more thing I nearly forgot. Please, if you enjoy these, go and rate and review it wherever it is that you listen to this podcast. It makes a massive difference in reaching out to more listeners. And if you want to help support the show, head over to patreon.com forward slash Byron Pace. That's B-Y-R-O-N-P-A-C-E. The link is also in the show notes. It helps make these shows possible. And uh, that's it. I will keep you no longer. Uh, Here is me introducing Professor David Beerling. Good morning, David. Welcome to the Into the Wilderness podcast. It is great to have you on today to talk about something which is incredibly important. And I love it when I see really important scientific papers that are published and also hit the mainstream. So I became aware of what we're going to talk about today because of an article that was originally published uh, in The Guardian, I think. Uh, And we're looking at this idea of spreading rock dust on agricultural fields to take CO2 out the atmosphere, which is or probably the big issue of our time if we ignore COVID for the moment. Um, explain to me how the, the research came about and, and probably what is basalt, because we're going to be talking about basalt rock, but this might be the first time anybody's heard of basalt rock. So uh, the research came about because, um, you know, I run a, a centre, a carbon drawdown centre called the Leverhulme Centre for Climate Change Mitigation, which is a bit of a mouthful, but basically we're talking about it were a centre that looks at all aspects of carbon drawdown using um, the, the chemical and biological weathering of silicate rocks. And basalt is a silicate, it's a natural silicate rock produced by volcanoes. So it's very abundant. And uh, it also has a number of um, plant nutrients in it or uh, mineral, inorganic mineral nutrients that can support um crop production and, and tree tree growth. And so the paper came about because we have a team within our Leverhulme Center uh, called the Earth, the Earth Systems Modeling Team. And they they wanted to know, you know, to a first approximation, is this really worth doing at scale? You know, when you've taken into account all of the different CO2 emissions associated with mining, grinding and spreading rocks, you know, to the best of our ability, with the best models that we can that we can make right now, is it worth doing? And and what would the cost look like? And so 
the paper was really a sort of, of what turned out to be a very detailed scoping exercise in, in feasibility. And um, as you say, when we published it, we got, we got a lot of uh, positive publicity. I think, I think what, what, um, what seems to appeal to people and certainly appeals to us is that, you know, to some extent it's a good news story. So rather than another gloom and doom paper about, you know, we're all going to fry in the future, our work was really a slightly more optimistic take in the sense that, you know, here's a strategy for drawing down carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere to combat climate change that at the same time could uh, combat or, or could um, address food security and, and rebuild our soils. Yeah, no, I love that because it's, it's something that we probably don't talk about enough, which is actually how do we improve soil health? Because we are, we are using the same soils over and over again to produce crops, to produce uh, grasses, which then feed livestock so that we can eat. And I, I think it's fairly well accepted that we're, particularly in some parts of the world, we're not putting enough back in. And there's been some studies out in, in recent years talking about this limited period of time that we really we actually have to carry on getting um, crops from our soils. So to have a system that potentially is tackling two issues of putting this, uh, the nutrients back into the soil uh, and, and creating the, these more healthy soil systems and taking CO2 out of the atmosphere, it seems like a, a massive win-win. That's right. And <clears throat> excuse me, we know that intensification of agriculture causes um, acidification of soils, both from repeated harvesting of crops, but also the application of uh, uh, fertilizers. And uh, you know, as a consequence of that, every few years, farmers have to apply lime or limestone to their soils to kind of reverse that soil acidification because when soils become too acidic then it inhibits the crops from taping taking up the nutrients they need and so you know one of the good things about applying basalt to soils it can reverse that soil acidification problem whilst at the same time capturing carbon so so that, you know that's one area where we've been abusing our soils uh, another area that it could that it could address another area is um depletion of micronutrients. So, you know, crops need, besides nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, the MPK suite of nutrients, they also need micronutrients like iron and molybdenum and so on to, um, to, to grow properly and produce decent yields. And, um, you know, what happens with intensive agriculture, of course, is that, you, is that you grow your crop and then you harvest the biomass. So all of, the, all of those micronutrients have come out of the soil into the biomass. And then you've harvested the biomass and removed, removed it the, from the field, and you know ad infinitum over decades. And so what what that process is doing is really stripping the um, pools of these micronutrients and depleting them and slowing your your rate of your your rate of crop production. And in fact, in Europe and the UK, we actually some farmers actually apply a mixture of micronutrients to their crops to help restore, help address this deficit in the soils. And again, as as um, basalts weather, then they can release some of these micronutrients back into the soils and um, help to build up soil health in that way. So just to backtrack a little bit, you said that we have an abundance of basalt rock on, on the earth. It is a byproduct of many um, other forms of mining. Just explain where we would find it and where in the world is it abundant and what is it, like chemically, what is basalt? The, the majority of the world's basalt is left over from um huge volcanic eruptions called um, that, that happened hundreds of millions of years ago. So there's there's huge amounts on the east and west coast of the US, in Brazil, uh, in China, and, and also in Australia. And um, much of this material is surface exposed, and some of it is actually in the way of other um, rocks and minerals that we want to mine. So, for example, in Australia... The, uh, the geology is arranged in such a way that um, the coal mining industry and the gold mining industry in Australia actually has to mine through basalt to get to their coal and their, and their um, deposits that contain the gold. And so Australia has hundreds of millions of tons of crushed basalt that's just lying around or going into landfill, which the mining companies uh, you know, had no interest in 
And it's a similar situation, um, although less extreme, for example, in the UK, where basalt in northern England, which again is left over from these large volcanic eruptions from hundreds of millions of years ago, is uh, is mined for aggregate. But then for every tonne of rock they mine for aggregate, it produces a a byproduct of 20 to 30 percent of the material is too fine to use. So again, it's stockpiled. So so basalt is either actively mined uh, directly because it's required, or is or is mined because it's in the way of some other important rock or sediment. Uh, and so the question is, you know, can we utilize these? Can we well, first of all, as we said in the paper, can we map and and drop an inventory of what's out there by on a nation by nation basis? And secondly, you know, can we screen this material and look at it for potential carbon capture uh, using croplands? Just to go back to the the economics of this, because so much of actually making uh, making the these kind of projects happen is well, is it economically viable? Now you mentioned that like that was essentially that was the, the core of this paper is like let, let's look at it and let, let's look at all of the all of the costs and, and inputs and work out when we play this out, do we get a net gain in terms of the costs and uh, taking carbon out of the atmosphere? So how does it uh, compare to other mechanisms of taking carbon out of the carbon cycle? Yeah, so we so as part of the paper we we developed an economics model, as you say, and um what we found was that for developed countries, so countries like the US and, and Europe, for example, we're looking at sort of in the range of sort of $100 to $180 a tonne of CO2 removed as the all-in cost. Whereas in <clears throat> developing countries like uh, Brazil and India, China, the cost was quite a bit less. It was more the $50 to $100 per tonne of CO2 removed. And obviously, that is more expensive than if you're trying to do carbon drawdown by planting trees, for example. But you know, on the other hand, it is quite a lot cheaper than if you're trying to do carbon drawdown using uh, industrial processes like direct air capture, you know, where you build huge machines that suck CO2 through fans and then extract CO2. Then you have to pressurize that CO2 and uh, inject it on and build a pipeline to inject it onto the sea floor. And, you know, direct air capture, you know, you're looking at sort of $300, $450 a tonne. So, so it's not cheap. But on the other hand, you know, enhanced weathering does deliver carbon capture that's cheaper than some of these other industrial processes. And uh, I guess it's worth pointing out that, you know, the, uh, the, the, the mechanism for paying for carbon removal is essentially uh, the carbon markets which is supposed to be kick-started by the Paris Agreement, but that's another story. But the, the World Bank has suggested that, you know, when the carbon, when the price for, when the carbon markets pick up, assuming they pick up, and the price for CO2 remo- removal is expected to reach the sort of $100, $150 per tonne by 2050. And, of course, if it reached that, that, that price range, then, um, you know, technologies that are within that sweet spot then become quite attractive for uh, deployment. And so, you know, we didn't have any a priori expectation for what the cost would be because nobody had ever done a nation by nation economic assessment before. So we were, you know, surprised and I guess pleased that, that you know, it came in more or less within that range envisaged by the World Bank in, for 2050. So potentially going forward into the future, we might have a situation where, uh, farmers would be paid for the amount of carbon that they can take out of the atmosphere by spreading basalt um, on their agricultural pl- um, uh, crops, but they'll also be gaining a benefit because they're improving the health of their soil. Yes, exactly. And um, I think you know when you set it set it in that context, it seems like an attractive option. But I think it's it's important to say that the um, you know the magnitude of the climate change problem means that we need emissions reductions because we're adding about 40 billion tons of CO2 a year to the atmosphere. And so you absolutely got to, you absolutely got to get that number down. But then because the CO2 hangs around in the atmosphere for so long, you also need technologies that will draw it back out again. And, and no one um, carbon removal technology will do the trick. There's no silver bullet. What we're going to need is probably a whole selection of carbon drawdown technologies from 
you know, enhanced weathering, direct air capture, tree planting, if all of them, you know, do their bit and scale up by 2050, and we've got emissions reductions, you know, then, then we're with a fighting chance of um, addressing climate change in a serious way. So you've just given us some some numbers there in terms of global uh, emissions of CO2. Uh, potentially, if this was fully imp- uh, implemented and uh, the carbon markets work, so there was an incentive for farmers to do it around the world, uh, potentially how much uh, could it contribute to the, the global drawdown in CO2? So so our, our analysis suggested, you know, if you did to a maximum, what, we, what we'd consider kind of a maximum realistic extent, you might get 2 billion tonnes a year out of the atmosphere. So you've got to think if you did 2 billion tonnes with enhanced weathering, 2 billion tonnes with direct air capture, you know, another couple of billion tonnes with tree planting and then another two with bioenergy crops, you know, you're close to the sort of 10 billion tonne target by 2050 that, that fighting climate change requires. So it does sort of contextualise the need, not only for emissions reductions, but also for a whole suite of um, uh, carbon removal technologies. It certainly does sound like hope. In, in amongst all the stories of which 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 is exactly how you opened this, which are largely a doom and gloom, and we're never going to be able to turn this round, and we keep failing our targets left, right, and centre. Every year we've fa- uh, failed to meet another target, but this does seem to offer uh, a glimmer of hope for the, the this twenty fifty target now uh, that has been set. I think so. You know, I would say that the you know the research into carbon dioxide removal technologies is very much in its infancy and um, it's the foresight of our funders the Levy Human Trust that funded us five years ago to not only do uh, modeling but also do field trials and public engagement of this technology and really we need more more funding agencies around the world to to um, promote research development and demonstration of negative emissions technologies because at the moment it's not it's not going fast enough. Now, I just I wanted to backtrack uh, a little bit just to try and envisage the the actual process of this, if indeed it, it was implemented, and maybe just give a very basic uh, sort of high school chemistry of how this is in fact working. So farmers are taking this basalt dust and they're spreading it probably with other things that they would be spreading on fields anyway. So it's now lying on these fields, which would be used to, to grow crops. How, how does it work? And I'm also curious, once you answer that, is, are there actually any downsides to this? So, so the way it works, I mean, we do have um, a network of field sites. Uh, we have a very large trial going on in um, with the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana. And what we do there is we apply 40 tonnes per hectare, usually after harvest, and then you know the soil gets turned over by chisel ploughing or, or some other technique, and then it sort of sits there. The material sits there, and then it's planted in the spring. And uh, what what drives the sort of chemical breakdown of it's basically a calcium silicate rock, and what drives the breakdown is the um, uh, corrosive nature of the of the soil pore water, so carbon dioxide from respiring roots and microbes in the soil mixes with soil water and makes an acidic solution which helps break down the rocks and then you can either capture carbon in the soil in the formation of um, carbonates trace amounts of carbonates and or uh, depending on the soil type and the conditions and so on you can also export it from the system in soil water in dissolved form in a bicarbonate form and uh, so those are the sort of two pathways of carbon capture. They're complicated. You know, they, 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 the reality is there's, there's more complexity when you start applying fertilizers and so on. But that's the, that's the basic approach. Oh, just to return to the, 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 your second question, you know, what are the downsides? Well, I think um, you know, we need to be careful that um, any of the materials that you, scre- that you apply have been screened to avoid um, heavy metal contamination. Um, you know, basalt is a natural silicate, and human societies have known f- for decades, if not hundreds of years, that the volcanic floodplains of um, of, of uh, islands and nations tend to be the most productive. Um, but when we've looked at when we've looked at, um, at any of the chemical analysis of our of our basalts we use in any of our sites, none of them have high concentrations of heavy metals. So, for us at least. 
that hasn't been a problem. And, and when we look at the, the edible tissues, uh, the seeds and so on from our field sites, we don't see any accumulation of heavy of heavy metals. So, so that's a good that's a good side. That's a good you know that's an upside in that it seems to be quite safe in that in that context. I wonder, given that we have such uh, varying climates around the world and implementing the same strategy, are there parts of the world where this particularly lends itself where you get uh, the most efficient use? I'm thinking um, soil acidities. I'm thinking the actual t- temperature of the soils. Yeah, so the fact is that drive in a faster um, chemical sort of breakdown of the basalt, what we call weathering, is basically controlled by temperature and water. So if you have warmer climates, then and you couple that with a with a wet climate, then you tend to have faster rates of weathering. So it, it would work where, you know, um, climates are warm and wet. So Brazil would be a, a very nice example. Also, parts of China and, and India would also be very conducive to doing this. And in fact, you know, parts of China and India are suffering from um, very extensive acidification of their cropland soils due to intensification of agriculture. So these might be, um, you know, key areas of deployment. But of course, you know, what's critical to the, what's critical to uptake is really, you know, buy-in from governments and also from farmers as well, so that the farmers are convinced that it's going to improve their yields and, and their soils. And I think the only way you really do that is is to do, you know, field-scale trials and demonstrations. And how are your field-scale trials going and how far into them are you? So uh, at the moment, we're sort of two to three years into our field trials. And um, we are already seeing some surprising results. We're seeing in, in the US, there's some year-to-year variation, but um, for the maize, maize, which is principally grown for bioenergy in, in the US, um, we're seeing increases, some increases in some years in maize yields in response to treatment, and also increases in soybean yields. And uh, carbon capture in the soils, this is all sort of preliminary work in progress. And then we're also working with um, oil palm plantations in Malaysia and Borneo as our kind of very warm, wet climate site. And there we do seem to be capturing carbon, and there's some early suggestions that uh, it's improving yields. Uh, in uh, our third site in, the, in uh, northern Australia, where we're growing sugarcane, we don't seem to see any kind of strong response of sugarcane yield. But we do see a strong, stronger response of carbon capture. So, so it's a mixed picture. But I, I think what we're seeing consistently is increased carbon capture, and some positive effects on um, soils and yields in some of these you know, diverse crops that we're looking at. David, this is a fascinating work, and like I said at the start, it's really great to see this being picked up by the media, which is how it first came to my attention. And I, I think it's important that this kind of work is in the minds of people and we should obviously all be more cognizant of our our impact on climate change and just as a a way to sort of bring this to a close as we look forward now into the future and we look at the work that you're doing how long do you think it might be before we can start to see this being implemented? I mean, how long? Well, maybe that maybe that's on the basis of how long are you you're running the, the field trials before you can start like presenting this information with uh, actual trials on the ground to farmers so that they can they can uh, make a decision based on yield, or is it really going to require this kick in of, of the carbon markets? Um, well. I'm hoping that we can will be in a position to start um, synthesizing the evidence from our field sites next year, and that would be the sort of midterm for our program. And then we have another five years of funding after that. And I think you know, if you want to change the mind of governments, you have to have evidence. You know, evidence based policy is the mantra. And um, I, you know, I don't think we can drive rollout on the basis of model results. I, you know, it's, to the outside world, anyone can build a model. I think what really convinces uh, uh, decision makers is evidence from field trials. And so I do see our field trials as being central to the success of, of, of the technique. And I know there are other funding, there are other groups around the world seeking funding to develop this in, 
in uh, different agro ecosystems. So I think, you know, maybe in 10 years time, if some of this funding comes off and some of these other field trials are rolled out and we get exciting results, in 10 years time, we might be in a position where we say, look, the evidence base is overwhelming. You know, we really need um, the agricultural community to take notice and start and governments and start thinking about how we deploy this. Um, but as, as the folks in, in the US always like to remind me, you know, the, uh, the farming community in the Corn Belt are very finely tuned to any kind of technology that can increase their margins. And, uh, you know, if after 10 years we can really demonstrate a solid, solid evidence base for carbon capture and improvements to soils and yields, then, then they, may, they may take it up without being pushed by government. I have to wait and see. Really, really interesting stuff. Thank you so much for taking the time out to join me today. A fascinating discussion, and I will stick the link to your paper and uh, the article as it appeared in The Guardian in the show notes for this podcast. Pleasure. Thank you very much for having me.